Um, that I think that, but to me, so many businesses get that wrong. Like they'll do this part amazingly and then this part terribly. Even staying in like local people's safe houses and things till he got out of the country. So even again, even in those really bad situations, you don't have to be in a firefight. Absolutely. The number one reason people give money is because they were asked. It is people's biggest fears. And I, I, I kind of toned it back a little bit, but I was like, I can't tone it back much more as to what the reality of life is. This is what's actually going on in the world. And if people want to help, these are the things they can do to help. The torment is that she has to pretend that she wants to be doing this. And that could be whether it's in the porn industry or whether it's in the, the sex trades. And, you know, there was people that tried to, to stop me. There was a specific woman who worked in the bank and she was, she she just took a disliking to me. I was 25, she thought I shouldn't be in there. And not only did she dislike me, but she tried her hardest to kind of sabotage the job for me. I remember hitting 37 and thinking, right, okay, now, mum never got to see this stage, so now we have to really make it happen. We have to really do it a bit differently. Alana, stop. Welcome to the Tim Castle Show. I can't wait to get into this conversation. You're a woman that's done incredible things from being a five-time author, releasing books throughout this year. And one of the books that I really want to dig into is She Who Dares, which is all about you overcoming big challenges in an autobiography and a memoir about yourself, which is which is true to my heart. I really like those kind of personal stories. So yeah, welcome to the show. I can't wait to get into this with you and discuss a lot more about your journey and what's brought you here today. Oh, thank you so much for having me and uh, accepting me. No, you, you consider yourself accepted. You know, this show, <laughs> it's all about meeting courageous people, doing inspirational things around the world. And one of the bits that I really loved when I was digging into doing some research for the show and who you were is you you do have this possibility mindset. You're not afraid to kind of go into situations and go hey is this a limiting belief or is this a limitation that's being placed on me by society or by a way of thinking I think this would be a good starting point for this conversation just how has that played out in your life and how can people see when they're just accepting their own limiting beliefs or limiting beliefs of society where someone's saying no you can't do this because like what what's been your experience yeah I mean I was I would say fortunate. I mean, it's not the most fortunate of things, but my mum passed away when I was really young. Um, and I think for that, not just because of the age that I was, but because of the age that she was, you know, 37 years old when she died and she, you know, I knew how much she wanted to live. You know, that was really important. And I could see what what she had. And obviously now was, I'm a mum of three now, you know, she was a mum of three when she died and she was a single parent. Um, and I think to myself, you know, how must that, as a child, it was it was a something that I was going through. But now I look back on it and I think at 37, that must have been terrifying to know that you were dying and there was nothing you could do about it. And you're leaving three children behind. So from then onwards, I've always almost well lived my life with, you know, no limits around me because I know how blessed we are to have life but also I feel like I'm living my life a bit for two people I remember hitting 37 and thinking right okay now mum never got to see this stage so now we have to really make it happen we have to really do it a bit differently um so I, I guess I've always lived like that and I've always thought about the impossible is just something that hasn't been done yet you know and, and I have I've kind of surrounded myself with with that type of people you know there was a portion of my life that I didn't and I didn't have those right people around me and you can feel that effect when the wrong people are in your life it pulls you down and it, it can really I mean I've always had the belief I can do everything but when those people are around you you do start to listen to them but maybe maybe it's me maybe I'm a bit weird and maybe I've, I'm having these thoughts and I shouldn't be like put your feet back on the ground um, and I think I corrected that by just getting rid of those people and the people in my life now are 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 very similar people to me that that also believe that nothing's impossible and we can we can go for it and actually when we see an impossible it's also right how we're going to get around this and what we're going to do mm. yeah it, it's it's very important isn't it, how environment shapes that but also like like because my mom also died um i would consider it early not as early as 30 how old were you when when she passed away yeah, 15 you were 15 okay i was 21 when my mom died and it was 
it's a, it's I've got I feel I resonate with this like I've got exactly the same feelings you make every day count because you're like hey that wasn't supposed to happen I never thought that was going to happen and it happened on you it like happens on your life and then your story of your life is like but the, the feeling inside is like well let's go for it and I, I completely get that piece around kind of just every day count like matters make it happen you know everybody deals with things differently and I meet a lot of people that lose parents young and I think um you know, a boy losing a dad and a boy losing a mom and a, mo- a girl losing a dad, they, these, they can be handled differently. But I've, I have seen people go the, the other way and say, well, you know, I'm just going to be depressed for the rest of my life. I don't want to be happy anymore. So I do think there is an element of choice in it. Like, wh- right, how are you going to take this forward? And I think it's one of those crossroads in your life where it's like, am I going to go forward? And am I going to make every day count and make it happen? And if you're if you're like me, even just a rest day or like a duvet day feels like a bit like we could be doing something here we could be doing something yeah even me and my husband will go on holiday and we'll have like two or three days into the holiday of maybe a seven day break and it'll be oh we're done we're done yeah. <laughs> yep let's do something productive like it feel, yeah. you feel guilty but not in the sense of like shaming yourself at all it's just like I have got more value to give I've got more things to do and the world almost needs that and I think that's a big mindset shift is like when we're talking about lack and limitation and limiting beliefs, there's a, when you flip it and you actually cross through those, you actually become someone that you're like, you realize that you have value to give. And that through that, when you break through those barriers, even if it's just inspiring someone else to go and do the same thing, it's giving to the yeah. world. And that when you get into that, you're like, Hey, yeah, I can't yeah. do it yeah, I it's like, Meh. a huge part of it for, for me, I was, um I had my own world but I had like my younger brother I had responsibilities I had other things to do so I had that ownership there and I think that's really important as well that you you've got the you've got the responsibilities and you've got the ownerships to to do like today for just as an example today I said to Dean I was feeling a bit you know when you're just feeling a bit yuck you're just feeling and Mm. and he immediately said to me have you worked out have you have you done anything I was like actually no it's been a really busy couple of days it's been back to back meetings and I did miss that so he's like well there's your there's your answer and I was like yeah okay okay you got me um so it's kind of that like we'll take responsibility have you have you done the things that you need to do to make things happen each day and if you're not then kind of do that do that thing I guess and and again like that that in itself like as a adult now and as someone that you know you you obviously have the right environment around you've got people in your camp that know what you need specifically but I think people listening as well like if you're listening to this and you, you haven't consistently done these things just simple things like exercise it is a big key to this and that you almost have to call yourself out on it and I think that's also it right when you're in the pit and the people around you aren't the right people, you have to be the person to get yourself out of that or to, to sort of get rid of those people, remove them from your life because they like remove the walls and the limitation from your life and then push things like exercise and the right thoughts in so yeah. that then you can elevate up and then meet and attract that yeah. set of people that's going to do think that is, is really important. And I, I think there's one word that we hear a lot um, for, for people like us is, is luck. You're so lucky. You're very lucky. And, you know, we all know it's nothing to do with luck. It's the hard work. It's the effort. It's the consistency. It's everything we're putting in every day. And I think it's 100 percent taking that, you know, the buck stops here. What what we do, um, if, if we haven't done all those things to make the things happen, then we, we're not going to get the results. So it's it's every single day just showing up and yeah of course you're going to have down days and you're going to have days that you're not feeling that great but then you've got to kind of check yourself and it's it's kind of that no one's coming to save you rule yeah make sure you've surrounded yourself by the right people get rid of the wrong the wrong influences around you but having that complete check on yourself every day to make sure you're doing it right definitely and and I also want to make sure we bucket this conversation not even to to block out it's just you have done so many things and you have so many things going on that I am like I just can't wait to get into it in terms of like you have a security firm that you're running personally which seems uh, like incredible in terms of a, a new kind of thing that I haven't even thought about like personalized security and you help extract people from countries where they're in a lot of trouble you're obviously in anti-human trafficking and making sure that people aren't ending up in the sex trade or in other forms of that and you've raised huge amounts of money to support charities that there's so many different parts that of your life that speak to this you've got an mbe from king charles 
the royal family um this year as well for your work that you've done to raise awareness around this and and to focus on it but if we just step keep keep on this flow of like you as a person changing your environment at 15 and then to where you are today obviously with three kids and successful author and and then, like you say people can just attribute it to luck and like oh you've got this life now you've got all of these different things and king charles is coming up and giving you an mbe <laughs> it's like oh yeah you're lucky but it's you're right it's it's literally every day eventually it pays off but it's it still happens today right you've got to kind of bring yourself up and motivate yourself and make sure that you're you're correct in you and, and you're taking ownership it's from those small steps you know when when i was um 15 in the area that I grew up in you know you'll know like the council estates in um Scotland you know they're they're mm. not the 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 greatest areas to be around and you're you're around certain people and things are happening to you it's really easy to make the wrong decisions and, and make decisions that are going to affect your life going forward so even at those young little steps I was looking and did I make mistakes a hundred percent like you know we all do and we 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 as long as we're kind of growing and learning from them and and I was doing that from a really young age and I think I had those those responsibilities to do these things but I always had these dreams and desires and I think one of the biggest thing I always wanted to do was help people so that always encouraged me into like the next step and whatever it was that I was doing but I think from what we were saying about this nothing's impossible thing I think the first I guess the, the biggest job that I got was as a bank manager mm. and when I applied for that job I do remember it was, um, before that I'd done like door-to-door -door sales and I'd been a debt collector and I'd done a number of other things but when I applied for the job as a bank manager it was very specific in the job title of you need a, a university degree you need x y and z none of which I had um, but I applied for it anyway and I thought I'm going to just go for this see how I get on I went to the interview, the interview was a few hours long, really, really well, and I ended up getting the job. When I walked into the bank on the first day, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I didn't know what a bond was. I didn't know what a share stock, I had none of these things. I had a clue what they were. So it was just a really quick learn it as fast as you possibly can um, and pretend you know what you're doing and just work it out along the way. And, you know, there was people that tried to to stop me. There was a specific woman who worked in the bank and she she just took a disliking to me. I was 25. She thought I shouldn't be in there. And not only did she dislike me, but she tried her hardest to kind of sabotage the job for me. On, on day one, she was like, is there anything you're struggling with? Is there anything I can help with? And I said, you know, I'm not quite sure about stocks and shares. It's, it's something new to me. And then when we went into our first company meeting, it was the first question she asked me, Alana, tell me about stocks and shares. And I was like, you bitch, like, how have you just done that to me? Um, but I quickly <laughs> realized that when, when people dislike you, sometimes they can, they can go to that extreme of actually trying to prove in their own head why they're disliking you to, to other people. Um, so that was, it was quite a lesson, but I learned really, really fast because actually the, the 2008 recession hit around that time. And everything was about learning about things that most people didn't actually know about or what was going on at the time. So it was all a big learning curve for everyone in the bank. Um, but I think it was finding my my husband that really, because I knew I had all this other stuff to give. I knew I had other passions. I had other things that I wanted to help. But when I met Dean, he was very similar to me. He had the same kind of, he loved to help other people. He loved to do things. Nothing was was too too much for him and I think one of the first things I ever said to him was you know he said what do you what do you really want to do is is banking your your thing I said it was something that I'm good at but um actually what I've always wanted to do is I've always wanted to be a spy and he was like oh, okay um and you know most people would kind of laugh at that and kind of shrug it off the very next day he had the application form for MI6 on my desk and one of his friends who worked in, in Whitehall, um, he he arranged a call with him so I could talk through the process of applying for um, MI6. So we went through and we went through the process and I, I got through some of the stages, but it was actually the stage of the um, the family background that I got rejected on. So I don't know what happened in my family. They don't tell you, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep that a secret. But um, I think from then onwards, it was like, right, okay, well, I can I can do something else then. I can't become a spy, but let's do. And then I think at that point, Dean was injured out of the military. So um, we ended up both going into the close protection world. And really, that was around my passion for um, 
fighting human trafficking at the time and one of my friends was uh, rescuing people out of Haiti and she was trying to get people to protect her and she couldn't because uh, of the price tag to 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 do that so I said well look what have I trained and then one day I'll be able to help you so I went into um, it was kind of an ex-special forces training course where people went and just learned about uh, everything about close protection it was residential so we were there for like four weeks solid it was an amazing course in Hereford um, and I learned about the world of close protection but around about that same time I got pregnant so again it would have been like an easy out to say well okay I'm having a baby now I'm going to be a mum but we just carried on I carried on training and learning about the security world while Dean went into actually working on the ground so I would be running the the kind of missions in the background doing the logistics and the planning and all these things while he was in places like Libya Yemen Somalia all these kind of places so we were learning a lot and doing a lot together and that's really when our working working together began I can't remember what question you asked me there but I just went off well, a huge it's time. amazing <laughs> and that is so inspirational just and, and I think the point of of all of that is you kept going no matter what like things things give you an out and you could easily just say we've gone down this road and this woman is literally trying to sabotage me at the bank and I'm a bank manager and I've got no degree and she thinks that I have to have a degree to be here but I'm here and I got the job and she dislikes it and you keep going whatever I think you actually also and something else I found that you got punched in the face as a bank manager and yeah yeah. it was um I was in Aberdeen actually and they had there was a strong thing about you know the customer's always right in this bank it was it was how they felt and when I first started I couldn't believe how abusive customers were to to the staff it was really quite something that I was like well I'm not putting up with this you know you can there's no excuse for bad manners never to me um so there was a few people that liked to speak badly to the staff and this one particular person he'd come in and he was being uber abusive um constantly to to the staff and and specifically to the, the female members and he was speaking poorly to this this girl once and it was just kind of enough's enough mm. and um i i said to him look if he didn't stop he was going to have his account closed and wouldn't be welcome to bank with us anymore and he carried on doing what he'd done and then so i said okay i'm going to close your account i kind of shut his account off i took all his paperwork out to him including his bank card handed it all over to him and uh, yeah then he just punched me in the face but what i didn't know is he had the bank card kind of still in his hand when he punched me so the card split my lip um, yeah and yeah it was it was a bit unfortunate but I, I remember we'd had it drilled into us at the time that you never fight back you never retaliate you lose your job if you do any of these things so it was almost like you just had to turn away and take this breath and just be like, and actually at the time, I remember him just ranting on about how um, he was within his rights. And he he just kept saying this over and over again. He was a, a gentleman from uh, Pakistan and he was overworking in Aberdeen on a, on a convent in the oil and gas. And I think the police, when they came in, they were also quite concerned that he would lose his job because if he has a, an assault charge against them, he would, he would now lose his job. So um it was it was a it was a really weird moment for me to see how things were actually taken and how things were reacted because if somebody's done something in there and they're regretful and they're remorseful I can almost handle that but when somebody's clearly not got any um shame for what they've just done there's obviously a bit of a, a concern for you there well yeah and it also reinforces the fact that that's okay as well it's sort of like it's clearly yeah. not okay and then it, yeah that's crazy and I guess I guess I'm dying to ask about what close protection looks like and what are the type of situations you're dealing with in Libya and, and these Yemen and these countries. When you're, when you're talking about these situations that you're doing the work on, like how does it happen? How does it play out? Um, so so close protection, I guess, for most people, it's bodyguard. That's the word that most people will, will understand it as. But um, the work that we've done yet... Yeah, sorry. Is it for like... Uh, like so like who would it be for like how would, would it be a celebrity would it be a royal would it be a diplomatic what how does that come hey i need a bodyguard or is it just someone that wants to it could be it? anybody so we could we've done ones for maybe companies that are there's protests going on within their organization so maybe the ceo needs uh looking after it could be somebody who's you know news reporters that are going in to report in dangerous zones that you need to bring in so it really varies you know most celebrities do have 
uh, close protection. And again, that all varies to the reasons why they have it. You know, some people really want the image. They want to be seen as having protection. Other people, you know, there could be people that there's people that don't even know they've got close protection. Certain members of like Saudi royalty, etc. If they go traveling, they think they're on their own, but they're not. They've got a lot of guards <laughs> around them. Wow. For them. So, yeah. That's more of like the surveillance protection. Females are very, very good at the surveillance, uh, which is just just the following of people and keeping an eye out. And um, we we do seem to be better at that. We're a little bit more because we we're, we're less ego led. We all kind of be able to blend in and do things a little bit easier than than men. I do remember on my on my course we were I think it was Gloucestershire we were walking around and and it's a smaller kind of town so it's not as easy to blend in like in like London for example and you know if the principal's kind of walking ahead and they say maybe stop to look in a in a window um, a woman can kind of just naturally kind of go with the flow of that whereas a lot of the guys were just kind of stopping still right where the person had just stopped and it just looks really uncomfortable um and in america it can be like you know the, the people that do the close protection in america as well they can they can look like bodyguards you know they look very obviously like a bodyguard so it's a lot so the, it depends what a person wants some people want the kind of simon cowell like you know two huge guys stood behind them that are very obviously they're protecting them and then other people like people that just blend in and nobody knows that they've got the security is there a difference yeah like you say like is one just for image and potentially just just for the look of it and it, it, yeah I'm, I'm important i've got these people and others is like if you're doing counterintelligence you're doing security it's like you would not want them to be seen and this yeah they like they, there's almost like a danger for them being seen because that makes you look like yeah it's, it's and that's, that's, the, uh, that's the work that we're in because you know, if you if you meet my husband, you'll look at him and you'll be like, I don't want to mess with him. You look at me, maybe you'd be like, OK, I would, I would you know, she she's not going to do anything. So um, for me, I always say that if people say to me, you must be super tough to be a, a bodyguard. I'm like, I don't know. I, I would never know because I've never been in that situation. You know, when you see it in the movies and they're kind of fighting and they're, you know, taking somebody down, I'm like, you should never have got to that stage in the first place to, right. to do that. So everything we do is about intelligence gathering, you know, finding out what the threats are, finding out if things are a dangerous situation, looking around, understanding, you know, personal awareness, you know, spatial awareness, situational awareness, all these things you're looking at constantly. Um, and yeah, we've got new technology and we've got things like online check and things we can do, but um really it's just about having that peripheral vision around you and seeing what's going on and if, what the threats are and you know if there is threats making sure we get out of there as quickly as possible so that's really what we're doing and what I do is more of the background stuff so I'm looking at background checks due diligence uh, sorry it's late um and checking like you know staff backgrounds things like that you know you, you're, there's a lot goes into vulnerability assessments and that's really what we're we're doing as more of our day-to-day -day stuff is checking out people's vulnerabilities really yeah so it's a mitigation strategy and prevention and, and like you said uh, that the main sentence for the highlight there is if it's in that kind of like where you're shooting at people or you're taking people out or taking people down that's already not what it's already gone wrong it's really not meant to be at that level it's already meant to be you shouldn't you haven't sure. done it properly there's there's definitely situations where they, it might be warranted you know for example mm -hmm. dean was in Libya during some of the, the worst times in Libya. Um, but even then he evacuated the entire Canadian embassy out of out of Libya from, from Tripoli to Tunisia mm. without using a weapon, without any trouble. And how he done that was, uh, Dean is amazing at integrating himself with the locals. You know, he forms really good bonds wherever he goes. So he was able to get help all the way along the route, even staying in like local people's mm. safe houses and things till he got out of the country. So even again even in those really bad situations you don't have to be in a firefight and you're controlling all of that right you're you're back at base making sure that the intelligence you're getting the situations as updates like it comes from from you yeah so, yeah we yeah. we do we before he goes we always plan it together and then while he's on the ground i'm looking at uh you know real time logistics mm. and all the various things and then yeah doing the planning flights paths all these kind of things there's a lot goes into it yeah that's incredible. I've never had someone on the show in this uh, field of work, but like, how do you, because that must be pressure, right? That That's pressure from the beginning, but at the same time, I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, you're, 
you're almost designed to handle that you're, you're calm under pressure and it doesn't feel the same you're able you're the whole skill set is that you're able to receive updates or news or he be in a situation where there is so much unknown or it's the threat is the threat alert is, is elevated but you're yeah. able to, like how do you handle my, pressure in that sense my, my dad actually says that i don't handle non-stressful situations very well <laughs> he's, he's like, you always have to be in some sort of but I think for me it's if I if that was the only thing I would probably be it's slightly simpler I think when it's sometimes I can be you know Dean could be in a situation where we're on calls we're dealing with sat phones we're dealing with various things and then my daughter's like I'm hungry or my son's like mom I want to like change the channel on this so you're dealing with like normal life on a constant as well um, and trying to deal with these other things and making sure that you've got to understand that each one's just as important you know like she's hungry she needs to eat um I also need to make sure that this person's connected with this person and doing the, these things so it's just it's just that constant um constant like that but as I say it's, it's, it's actually worse when we're in like a calm situation I feel really quite awkward when we're not dealing with some sort of tragedy or something that's going on um and I don't know I think there's certain people that are maybe built to deal with that type of thing a little bit a little bit better and I think maybe it comes from you know the childhood situations and, and things that you can you can handle stuff but I do believe that if you have those abilities that you should definitely be doing things in those arenas to to be helping people too so um using using your powers in a good way I guess yes it's almost like what's happened to you becomes uh, like you're able to help those who are still in that situation because you've been in that situation and then if you've got yourself out or away or changed your environment if you've been suffering from abuse or a certain other you've been around drugs or whatever it is like whatever the situation was it gives you there's some good in that that gives you the skills to then be able to kind of go I and think managed to get through you know whether it be abuse or whatever it might be that you've 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 come out of you've you've got through it you know and you know that and I think there's there's uh something that's built in your brain that really says well I got through that so I can get through this situation and you know even the you know the worst situations in your life you you can remember them and you can be like I handled that so this 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 I'm going to handle too you know we'll get through this too mm -hmm. so then then your sort of energy around fighting human trafficking um and like what is because I, I think that this is just just on a baseline level like there's a lot like I looked into it before obviously this show and research but I was I was just surprised by some of the stats and that the extent to which this is happening both yeah. just human trafficking sex trafficking the numbers like it's obviously huge numbers in the millions 40 50 million people are trapped in this type of environment but it's it's today's age and we don't sort of see it or hear it but we do and it's kind of like the blinkers are on like how is this happening and like what is the real truth of the matter like why is this happening I mean as you say it is um it's a 150 billion dollar industry with almost 50, 50 million slaves in the world today it's the more slaves than any other time in history and we do all these things to try and tackle it um but we're in a world that's that's always changing you know we're in a instant gratification world that's our first thing is that we need when we want something we want it now if we want um you know anything that we order we can have it within a few hours everything is delivered straight away there's no patience anymore in getting anything and that has to come from somewhere you know we have to get those order orders fulfilled amazon comes from somewhere and the more that we want the more this order is the supply and demand the basic economics really um and the cheaper these things are getting, you know, the cheaper our clothes are getting, the cheaper things, the less is being paid for these things, you know. So if we're looking at these factories in Bangladesh or and and there'll be people that will say, well, yeah, they've got jobs, but yeah, these jobs are like 20 hours a day sitting in a factory, you know, sleeping underneath the 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 desk of your your sewing machine seven days a week on the constant until God knows what might happen. And it's funny because a lot of people when they're talking about the human trafficking, they're talking about the sex trafficking as being the ultimate worst. But a lot of these kids that are trapped in in some of the the more the the, the forced labor or domestic servitude, they can almost look at the, the the traffic children and be like, well, they've got it a bit easier because they're not having to work as hard as what what we're doing or or the amount of hours that we're doing. Um, so the whole to to tackle human trafficking, we have to kind of look at it as a whole. We have to look at the 
forced labour, the domestic servitude, the organ harvesting and the sex trafficking to be able to tackle it. And I think that every single person has within them the ability to end it by being less demanding on, on the world and the needs of things. Um, like, do you actually need that 16th Amazon parcel today? Does it need to come now? Um, and I think, you know, I think it's it's really important that we talk about, I remember when I got asked to do a TED talk a couple of years ago, and my TED talk was really about six ways that every person every day can stop trafficking. And I really go into a lot of detail about the simple things you can do, like, looking out for you know is the price of that nails that you've just had done less than what you'd expect minimum wage to be then then we need to question how are they being paid the materials all these kind of things so just kind of opening our eyes a little bit more car washes you know what are you paying for the car wash how many people are serving you all look out for sleeping bags all these types of different things so i wanted to do this ted talk to really give everybody these little tools to see and yes i do talk about um, sex trafficking and sexual abuse and, and these types of things and the lady said I couldn't I couldn't use these kinds of words because they were too provocative and we didn't want to upset the crowd and we didn't want to scare the crowd and I, I, I kind of toned it back a little bit but I was like I can't tone it back much more as to what the reality of life is this is what's actually going on in the world and if people want to help these are the things they can do to help um, and in the end she was pushing that much for me to to kind of tone it back I just said you know what oh, thank well. you for opportunity I'm not doing it you know if you want to do that then you could probably deliver that talk but I need to be able to know that I'm helping and the, you know what I talk about a lot is the prevention of human trafficking that's something that I'm really passionate about there is a lot of people that are attracted to the the, the saving victims of human trafficking which is I think glamorized by movies and things that they want to be the the kind of hero of of the hour and, and go and save this person but we don't need to be in that stage. We we could be we could be working on the prevention. You know, with, with eighty three percent of people um going and trying to being groomed online, uh, this is where we can really stop it. And I think a lot of people think because of the movies that that, that kids are kind of bundled into the back of a van and taken off and sold in a warehouse to um you know horrible men. Mm. That's the reality. Is that most of you know the kids they're walking into those cars freely and they're walking into the life freely, not knowing what they're doing. Um, by things like the grooming methods, the lover boy methods, all these types of things. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a slow process. And, and if, if we can, you know, this stage of it, the grooming stage of it, which isn't actually illegal, you know, the the, the part where we're, we're making her kind of fall in love with you. Yeah. Um, Taking this, you to parties, giving you the lifestyle, making you think that you're going to get all this stuff, a big cash reward, this can be your life. And then you're slowly falling in love with that person. And then suddenly... Yeah. There's a, there's a little favor asked yeah there's a little favor can you do this little thing for me and it kind of goes from there so these are the bits I think we can be showing people and you know I've heard of people who have delivered programs in Africa and various different things where we've shown girls these methods and then they've seen it and then it's happened and they've managed to you know understand that this is what's happening to them okay we can stop this and then we've just saved six people from ending up in the trafficking world the problem with the preventative world is there's not a lot of funding for it because people can't see the, re the results of mm -hmm. prevention mm -hmm. so there this is where i kind of try and push people to work and anyone that's working in that preventative education awareness field that's that's where i would encourage people to to get involved but as I say, there's so much every single person can do every day by just having that eye opening moment and seeing those little things and working in each area and just, you know, I guess being less, um, I don't want to say greedy, but being, you know, looking for the quality over the quantity, you know, mm -hmm. being less, less of a need for that instant gratification of everything that we're going for now. And we can pull that back a bit. I think we can add to that with the awareness that we're all seeing we could we could make a, a dent on this because it it is 150 billion dollars a year you know the, the the entire u.s core marine budget is 46 million so it's three mm. times that budget so mm. we kind of do need to fight it all together yeah it's a collective move that's the way and and like you said it's just understanding that everything has a consequence everything has a price if you're getting something super cheap and it feels unreal or it's delivered the next day or it's like you're demanding it's got a cost to it. It's just you're not seeing that cost and you're also potentially not aware of that cost because it's not highlighted. But if you looked and you tried to, it takes a simple Google search to see how fast fashion is 
playing out in other places yeah. and what that really means and read those words and digest them and then understand that just donating this and trying to save someone going there and pulling those people out doesn't fix it necessarily and what you're saying is then it's about prevention and it's like it's like if if you're trying to instead of giving people who have got less money more money that they just they don't know how to use that money to then create yeah. money or teaching them to get rich two different paths we've got to teach them to get rich and so you're saying educating these girls they can spot the signs for the for the tactics that are used and then they see it play out with one person and oh yeah one stops uh, it doesn't goes through it and it's a shame but like the 10 that witness it and see it play out manage to go hey i saw what happened there that that looks like that thing that we got educated on and they can yeah crack. and i think under, understanding that the the the, the traffic in industry is not something that anybody tells you they're in the industry. They're, you know, nobody's about yeah. to tell you that yeah. they're, they're being trafficked or they're in this. And it doesn't matter what area of you're in the, uh, you know, the, the sex trafficking side of it. A lot of people that I've spoke to that, you know, do participate in the purchasing of, of the, the sex trade, they would say they would never go with anybody who's being trafficked. You know, they, all the people, all the, the women that they pay money to are doing it off their own back because they want to. And it's nice for them to believe that, but it's probably not true. Yeah, there is, of course, there's sex workers who do mm. it completely off their own back. And, you know, more power to anybody who's doing anything. Like For me, it's anybody who's been forced to do something that they don't want to do and not being paid for doing the work that they're doing. And that's that's where this is going. The problem is it's very difficult to determine because, you know, that that girl being forced into what she's doing, she part of her part of the 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 torment is that she has to pretend that she wants to be doing this and that could be whether it's in the porn industry or whether it's in the the sex trade so um it's very difficult to determine if you're actually watching or with or whatever somebody who wants to be doing this um and then and very similar to when i'm talking about car washes and nail salons mm -hmm. and all these types of things so it's about just keeping and having that awareness a bit more Let's say you do see the sleeping bags at a car wash or, you, you, you know, someone's really underpaid at a nail salon. What should that person do in that specific scenario to address it? Um, so for the US and the UK, there's there's human trafficking hotlines. Um, so that would definitely be the first point of call. Also, the, you do have the local police and things. Now, every local police force is trained differently. I'm in Orange County and we have the Human Trafficking Task Force here who are fantastic at training the police and they've been doing that for 10 years and they do an amazing job. But there is many departments who don't have that training. So it might not necessarily be the, the police that are the people, but there's so many organizations, usually local organizations, but they do have the hotlines. I, I know you're in Singapore, so I'm not 100% on that but there will be uh, a local a local so flag it up and then these people are specially trained to deal with the scenario which is the fact that sometimes i mean these are vulnerable individuals who are also afraid of the consequences of not only the police but also the people that are holding them hostage that have their passports that have monetary debts that they have been brainwashed there's things with their family that they're paying off there's all this extra baggage that comes with the, and this is where the, the this is where the training comes in because a lot of the time they look at people who want to go right. I'm going to go and rescue. And I think we see yeah. a lot in America. Bless them. Where they, you know, a group of Navy SEALs will get together and go and bust something down and rescue people. As you've just described, you know, when you've gone through the grooming process and the lover, they these girls can't be in love with this guy, and they're like they're not going anywhere. They you need to almost break down this abuse before they're going to understand what they've been through and um, before you can break them out of this this prison that they're they're in sometimes it's in their own mind and they, they've got to they've got to come out the other end um, and so sometimes the whole like we're going to go in and rescue you thing can just re-traumatize a person so it's almost like when I, when I say that I mean leave it to the professionals you know it's very much the same where you see those videos where the, the kind of somebody confronts the pedophile and then you know we're going to either attack him or we're going to take that can sometimes cause a bit of a problem because there is processes that we need to hmm. to go through to get the justice for the victim and get this person um behind bars and sometimes like the forces themselves will go through all these and then some kind of vigilante method will come in and could mess it all up and it could be a, a gang or it could be like a wider network that we've just stopped being right. taken down there's by this one play. yeah there's a bigger play not just the one individual and then they've saved that person what they think of saved but actually it's done less to actually stop the whole thing but also yeah. the person hasn't maybe changed 
mentally in yeah. that sense. And it, you know, it's it, it's a big, it's yeah. organized crime. You know, it's a huge, it's it's bigger than the drug industry. It's it's a huge. Hmm. So taking down that one person or stopping that one person is great, but you could stop so much more being safe. So I do kind of say just leave it to the professionals. You know, like it, it mm. is like don't get me wrong. I'm a mother of three, and anybody who hurts kids or, or hurts women mm. or does things. I want to do that to, to them myself you know I want, I want to go in there it's really hard you know I've interviewed traffickers I've interviewed pedophiles I've interviewed these people and it's the most horrible thing to have to do but we have to do it to get inside their mind and to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it um so that we can help more people so yeah it makes you mad and your instant reaction is going to go yeah. in. I mean, I, you, you've seen what my husband looks like I just literally them like go and get them but <laughs> yeah that's the right way to do it yeah, and I think it's like with the fashion brands, you know, if it's H&M or some other brand that you, you think is um, exploiting, it should people just be calling out, putting pressure on the brands to take responsibility to take, like, is that the way forward with that is to sort of put pressure I mean, yeah. on? I mean, I'm not a big fan of um, cancel culture, but in these instances, yeah, if we're... To raise your standards. Be, yeah, raise your standards. And, you know, if the, if the if the company, and I'm not going to name a lot of names, but there should be a modern slavery statement on every company's website. You know, there is, I mean, for example, in the UK, I believe it's um, 30 million plus, but really every company should do it. Uh, they should be showing that they're they're doing the practice. And I remember when I spoke to Scottish Rugby about, about slavery and they decided just off their own back that they were going to every um contractor that came in they were going to make sure that they were all being paid well and they just off their own back they decided they were going to do this they didn't have to it wasn't a legal implementation from the modern slavery act but it just meant them there forward any contractor that came in had to be paying their staff well had to be doing everything correct have to have everything so those kind of things ripple and i think that mm. if, we, if we look less at profits eventually the profits would kind of come in because if you're quality and you're selling so rather than going out and buying three pairs of jeans this week for like 30 bucks each we could just wait a little bit longer and get a nice pair for 100 you know a, a better quality and that one that you know people are having to die to to make yeah literally and that's that's the reality and just understanding that the 30 dollar jeans come from somewhere there's a reason it's 30 dollars um yeah yeah mad right um switching gears uh, a lot there's a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners and ambitious individuals that listen to this show and one of the things that they really want to know about and this aligns very much with your book how to ask for money is how to ask for money um which you are a massive specialist at so can we get into that and like i mean what is the number one reason people give money like how, how did people do it Absolutely. The number one reason people give money is because they were asked. Like that is that is the number one reason. Um, and it is people's biggest fears. Like people are, you know, a lot with public speaking and all these things, not asking for money is terrifying. And it's just this fear of the unknown. They don't know what this person is going to say. So for all the reasons that we fear things, you know, we don't want to be embarrassed, we don't want to be rejected, um, mm -hmm. the failure, all these things that, that come in to asking for money is what stops us from doing it. So really the way to get around that is to take out that unknown, to make, you know, to put as much possibility of the yes as possible. Uh, and that all comes into the planning and really um, what I developed uh, from everything that I've done, I thought I'm going to put it in and the formula kind of came to me and I was like, well, what do I do? And it's about getting myself into the correct mindset. It's about having my own accountability. It's the planning and it's the strategy. So kind of maps was formed from that and then I put it into a book and then that's that's where how to ask for money came from but really it did come from a meeting in, in Newport Beach in Orange County with a real top executive and I remember the moment that he just broke out into a sweat and he was like oh no I'm gonna have to ask for money from someone in a second I was like why are you sweating and he's like I hate this stage and you know and he's like you know huge business he's he's done very successful and he's still terrified at this stage so I was like this is what I do and this is how I do it and he and he said you know you need to make a book because it is the scariest thing for businesses and non-profits you know so originally it was it was to help profits and then as I was coming through it was like well the fundraising side of anything whether it's looking for investment whether it's looking for donations it should always be taken as a business in itself this section should be taken as a business so it doesn't really matter if it's non-profit or profit we treat it as a business 
And how important, because obviously if you're a startup that's, uh, or you've got a business and you're there or you want to pitch and you're raising money, or, how, or even if you are a charity, right? How important is it? Like, because obviously when you're a startup or an entrepreneur or you have a business, you are so passionate about the thing that you have and you think it's the best thing in the world, but you also know that this money is, is what you assume is going to give you freedom and you potentially are just trying to force your beliefs onto that person like how would you suggest that someone goes about it differently and what do you think the the money receiver or the money giver is really looking for off of off of you as the the pitcher um, yeah you're, where, why does that go wrong or what, if what you're in this as you know it's about how is important is this how how important is this pitch to your business or how important is this to your charity? Um, not how important is your cause or your business, but how important is this money to your charity? And if it is important, then you'll do it properly. If it's not, then you'll write it on a bit of paper and like, you know, fumble your way through the pitch. You know, or, or are you going to walk in with a successful business plan fully prepared? And I think that, um, you know, when we're, when we're looking at a cause let's just say we're looking at childhood cancer and childhood cancer is so important to you and you're going to spend the first hour talking about childhood cancer and the guy in front of you doesn't give a shit about childhood cancer he's got no he doesn't care about it he actually doesn't like children you know like he, he really so when you're trying to pitch this to him it's just going in one ear without the other but it's so important to you you're going to keep going that's kind of the biggest mistake the, it is really the number everyone is going for the cause or going for the per, like what this person needs to know is how is it going to benefit them mm -hmm. what is me giving you money going to do for me and that is really is the way that most people work and even if the for me is part of the give back they still want to know me giving you this money is it going to align with my company csr our social responsibilities is it going to align with what our business plan has this this year is it aligning with our business and that's how you make it work. So that is part of the planning strategy is who are you approaching? Who are you going to speak to? And what is it that, that we're going to be able to connect with them? I mean, I always say to find out other people's motivations before you meet them. You know, the person that you're about to deal with, what is it they are interested in? You know, do a bit of stalking on them, whatever it might be. If it's a company and you don't know who you're going to meet with, make sure that you're, meet, you're meeting at least with the right person. You're meeting with, you know, the cleaner might be a really fun chat and they might be way more interesting but they're not going to sign that check you know um so really the 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 planning stage of it is probably the most important bit the bit when you're finding out all the information before you walk into the room i think if you look at the kind of sharks tank dragon's den type of shows where somebody's pitching to a group of people for a lot of money you always know the ones that are going to be successful or the ones that really have walked in there knowing their numbers knowing their figures knowing their forecasts all these things are kind of rolling off their tongue when you see them kind of stumbling not knowing the answer not knowing what to say not knowing their product their competitors all these things that answers should be available uh you know they're about to get a rejection the ones that are you know really i guess the, sh the shark's tank type of idea is sometimes yeah they love the product and they just really want to get involved with the product but more more to the point is how much money are they going to make and and how much is it going to benefit them which then which then is like how it's really can i trust you to deliver on what you're saying you're doing like they're investing in you and that that's the underlying bit of it it's like you're saying all this stuff and even if you articulate it correctly they're looking at you going how good is your team? How good are you at making yeah. that thing that you've just said speaks to what I need happen? Because if if also all that goes wrong, I haven't even got my objective. Like what's in it for me goes away. So it's like, it's and I think there's so much of it that people concentrate on. You know, like what am I going to wear today? What am I going to? Mm. How am I? But I think for for me, yeah, that is important that you're getting yourself into the right mindset. You know, if you go out drinking the night before, um, you've got the jitters, you have three coffees before you walk into the pitch, you know, all these things, it's not going to do a great job for you. But I know that one time I got asked to do a pitch. Um, it was actually we were trying to get five hundred thousand pounds of sponsorship for an event, and I got the call from the wealth management company asking if they could see me that day I wasn't prepared I wasn't ready for this but I, I did I did know my basics mm. so I was ready to I was I had done pre-planning so I had a bit of but it was kind of instantaneous which I was nervous about but I still knew my figures and knew what I was talking about and as you say I had this belief in the success of this campaign so I was able to talk about it in that kind of passionate way still with those those figures in my head and did actually get the sponsorship on that day so um 
I guess that always being prepared comes into it too there. But I, I think one thing that I always notice is when I'm working with military people, they seem to be able to to do this a little bit better. I think military people in the boardroom seem to have a little bit more understanding because, you know, they've come from that operational background and they've come from having a set of plans and orders and, mm. and various things. So they, they're able to give you a bit more of that that detail. Um, but I would just, I, I think that that is the key is just having as much information as you possibly can and having the answers, having all the answers. Yeah, it's it's the and the confidence comes through that, right? If you if if the person sitting opposite you can almost they can direct the conversation and you've got the right answer to that question that you're able to confidently deliver without umming and ahhing, without having the jitters, without going, I need to check back, just deliver giving the information that you should know. But the fact yeah. that you don't know it is a huge red flag. And that's the thing that trips people up rather than the military background where it's like, we have a plan. This is how we will deliver success. Yeah. This is how it will benefit you. And this is and a, yeah, a, do a donor or an investor, unless you've managed to find a super invested donor or investor, they don't want to be doing that stuff. If you don't know it, what do you want them to go and find it out? You know, right. that's that's that is the real issue for them. It's like, well, we need somebody who's just going to do this. We don't want to be having to hold your hand mm -hmm. and go and find this stuff out. Or even worse, if it's in the nonprofit, we don't want you to be being non-compliant by what you're doing. And and I think if you if you don't know what you're talking about to them, then they don't want to be involved with that. Yeah, it, it, yeah. If, if you're going to make our brand look bad, or you're going to do the exact opposite thing of what we're purposefully trying to do here, um, it's not going to speak to anything. So you've already lost right before you've walked in. And I, I love that you went for it, even though you were like you were prepared, like you said. But there are. It's not about being over prepared in the sense of like that's also going to stifle you if you're like, oh, it has to be perfect. It's like yeah. you're willing to go in and see that seize the opportunity that's on the table if it comes to you tomorrow. But it's the fact that you know your stuff, you believe in what you're doing. And you're going to go in and give it your best shot. Yeah. And I, I think that came to like, not leaving the study to the last minute and making sure that you are fully um, prepared at all times. It just happened to be, I think I was wearing like a pink sweater and white jeans that day. I wasn't really dressed for going into like a, a London wealth management office at the time, but it, it worked out in the end. But, and then I think the next stage of a, a big part of the book is the stage after, you know, we I deal with a lot of donors who get, constant requests you know and they, and they maybe one will stick and they'll do it and then they'll never hear from that person again till the next year when they want more money again and that really that is a that is the best way to really piss off a donor is to just ignore them for an entire year then ask them for money again because it is really insulting somebody who's worked hard for that money they've, they've got to that stage because they've battled and it almost feels like they're being treated like they're nothing but um purse strings for this person right. Um, so so the more engaged you can make your donor, the more grateful, the more informed, valued, all these things that you can you can do. And it's simple. It doesn't have to cost money. It can be like by doing little newsletters or doing social media posts or some 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 donor. And it's important that you do check that the donor wants to be publicly uh, known for what they're doing. Um, and if they don't, you've got to respect that, too. But you can still do private thank yous and, and little little things like that. So um you know valuing your donors is just as important as getting your donors in the first place and i think the big win is that i mean i love that that strat as a strategy that applies to clients it applies to donors it applies to <clears throat> anyone that you're super grateful if you couldn't have done that without them if there's something that they're giving and they've worked super hard like they've gone up a mountain to get that money and then you're slapping them in the face saying i'm not you are literally using them as as, as a purse like oh we need the purse again come back in let's do a dance and make you give us money it's like i hear it all the time with um clients and businesses you know like they, they're awesome customer service right up to the point that they get the check and then it's gone you don't hear from them that you can't get hold of them you can't you know know the answers the phone all these things and then it's like first of all that customer's not coming back to you and second of all they're not recommending anybody else to come to you either i think those that one customer can be worth five six ten customers if you treat them nice and the more you treat them nice the more they're going to talk about how amazing you are and how pe other people should use them and um that i think that but to me so many businesses get that wrong like they'll do this part amazingly and then this part terribly which is everything and and that's the point right if you if, if they're doing this part terribly and so many companies or businesses are doing this part terribly that's your biggest opportunity because if you don't do it terribly and you do lean in and you do value your donor or your client 
you're going to stand out and you probably get more money, even more, because you'll collect all the money that he's now, or they've now got because they're not going to give to those other people again. So they've done double down on you. And there usually is, especially in the, in the, the tra- charity world, there's, you know, thousands of organizations in the same field who are all fighting for the same money and fighting for the same pockets. And, and the ones that do value their donors and treat their donors well and, you know, invite them to events and do these little extra little things above and beyond, they get remembered. You know, if it's just like an occasional mail shot email or something, you know, the more personalized you can make things and the mm. more you can make them feel like, almost make them feel like, you they are your only donor like if you can make them feel like that all year round then you'll keep them and you'll get all their friends and you'll get all these things um but and it's really not hard to appreciate people but we get it wrong we I, do we were focusing because we're focusing on ourselves and not on them and we're focused on what we need to do and it's like if we oh we need more clients we need more clients we need more donors we need, yeah but you've already got them and they've got if you just yeah. treat them right They've got 20 friends that are your new donors, your new clients. So we're constantly looking for that new business when the new business is right there waiting for you. If you could just just use your ones you've got there. It's crazy. Speaking my language, Alana, you are speaking my language. So what was it like getting an MBE? Like, how did that come about? Um, so I, I actually got the email at uh, the beginning of December last year, and I thought it was spam or I thought it was, you know, like one of those, you know, Nigerian friends that want to give you like 100 million. I kind of was ready just to delete it. Um, but I thought, no, I'll, I'll keep it just in case. And it basically said that it wouldn't be announced until the end of the month. But if you had any um, reason not to accept it, then you shouldn't. So I got the email and I announced that I was going to get it. And um, well, no, I think that the, the press announced it in the UK and then I said I was going to get it. And then um, I had to really wait until I guess it was July till we could go back. And then we met Charles, my, my son came with me, um, my daughter and my dad and Dean were all able to be there, which was great. But my seven year old was just completely and utterly bored the whole time. <laughs> he was in the palace he just spent the whole time complaining about how bored he was and I think even just to the point where I was about to go up to King Charles he just shouted out how bored he was which was nice but <laughs> I'm gonna meet the king hey oh, I'm so bored like this is yeah. just like yeah. oh I can and totally he, imagine that he was in the palace and you know I, I don't know if you've ever been in any of the palaces in England but they've got all this like chairs and fancy things around and he's just trying to sit on all of them and I'm like Tommy no there's ropes around it you can't go there and he's you know but he was a seven-year-old who was completely like he'd had enough by that point he just wanted to to be done so it was but you know it was great it was it's definitely something um that I know that will be useful for the human trafficking cause going forward you know having that especially in America you know having that kind of um association can can really be beneficial so I, I i do i will use it for that purpose do you and harry compete on obviously he's got spare out like obviously rocket are you like look because sometimes like in the charts you're gonna compete i mean he's just that little bit cooler than me isn't he like i can't get like nobody wants to um have me on every single network and and channel you know <laughs> i mean he looks like he's not been on you so right I'm losing right yeah. you're winning on the tim <laughs> show because exactly. harry has not been on yet but we could this is a you know obviously an invite if harry wants to jump on after and we can then kind of see get side of it yeah exactly see <laughs> <laughs> i do want to point out your books though because you do have behind you your children's books and the two books the memoir she who dares and it, the, the she who dares title comes from he who dares right the british um, yeah, it yeah. was it was just a play on uh, he who dares wins really. So I, I kind of stole it for she who dares because I think so. Um, but yeah, Dean Dean released Relentless, which was his book in the UK, and then we re- released it here. And when he released the UK one, a lot of people did say like, "When's Alana putting her book out?" And it was never something that I re- I'd always kind of I w- I've been writing all my life. I love writing, but it was never to release anything. And I think when I spoke to a friend and she said, "Look." what's it about we spoke about it and she ended up telling me her story and I thought you know maybe I do need to put this out there a little bit and um since it's been out I've had you know amazing emails and dms and things about people that have read it and are sharing their own stories and for me that's almost enough like I'm like yeah this is why I'm doing it as long as it's helping one or two people this is why 
it's out there so I'm really glad that I've shared it and I'm able to speak a bit more about various different things and yeah it's so she who dares how to ask for money I should really should have I've got Dean's Relentless there as well and then the the three kids books that are that are it's coming awesome. out yeah I want to commend you because like the reason she who dares is getting those responses is because you've had the courage to be vulnerable and share yourself like if you're not going to be open and authentic and I, I know this if you then it's hard when you're editing it and you're going through the process and the editors come back and they're like redlining everything and doing all these different things and you're like no this bit has to stay in because that is the linking piece and this is how it is and at the end of yeah. the day like that's the bit that resonates with someone that helps them and if you don't do these things and you don't be vulnerable and put it out there as it is it it, it's, yeah. it lessens the effect so hats off to you for, to I think How to Ask for Money was a fun book to write because I didn't just put down what I was I, I went and researched a lot of things about money and I'd done a, a bit more things so it did still take about a year and a half for me to put hmm. it all together um She Who Dares was almost like I guess four or five years in the making but yeah. that was 100% more scarier because you are just putting your life out there and you're unsure about exactly how it's going to be received and also I think writing it because um there was no kind of ghostwriting involved I was writing it and I was editing it um you're going back through the stuff in your life that that was but I guess there was a bit of therapy involved there as well as I was doing it and I was kind of chatting to my younger self along the way going you know good girl well done you you've done it like keep going keep going (laughs) Yeah, it's a cathartic experience, isn't it? Um, it's definitely strange to have all your friends kind of know every aspect of your life, though. It's very, very interesting. But and also people like who, who like random people, right? They they would then know more about you than you know about them, and it's just it's it's great if it's helped them. That's that's the purpose, right? And it's just the intention has been met. So it's it's such a it feels like all that blood, sweat, and tears you put into it because it is hard. It's hard slogging, especially when it's personal. To write a book yeah. then the, un- the end result you don't see it until years down the line when people start yeah, exactly. yeah. and I think yeah and the, the more you know I think when people who know me have read it, it it's quite an emotional experience to hear them hear things about you that they were, maybe didn't realize or they didn't know the full mm-hmm. extent of everything but people that don't know you and they actually understand what you're saying and you can get it that's that's that is quite powerful um so yeah I'm really glad that I've done it and I, and I think I've always been an open book it's always been um if you ask me a question I'm going to tell you the truth it's always been that way so I think the more that the more that I'm talking about things you know I've worked in human trafficking now for 14 15 years possibly more and I've just done my thing and now that social media and everything has this ability and we can start talking I can I'm talking about it more um, the more I'm talking about it, the more I'm realizing actually, yeah, this can be beneficial. Um, and then even, you know, the other day, my my daughter came on a podcast with me. And she's 12 and we spoke about child online safety and mm-hmm. I talked about what we do. And it was really quite amazing, even for me to listen to her saying that I was I was one super proud. And um, but two, like thinking about how many people could be listening and being like, this is this is a lesson here. Like, can you hear it from a 12 year old now? Mm-hmm. Um so I think the more we actually talk about it and bring that awareness out, we can we can make more kids safe. This is beautiful. And even the fact that your family and your kids are kind of learning and growing through this and then becoming, they're planting the seeds early, right? So then they're not understanding all of these things and then it has another impact, another layer of impact, especially if they're coming on podcasts and telling it. Yeah, it's huge. She was pretty brave. I was I was thinking about a way that I could do it because we talk about child online safety, but a lot of the times it can come from people like us talking to kids about it. And really, like, what do we know? We only use like mm-hmm. Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. We're that old. We've still got Facebook, you know, so um, we don't know anything. So hearing it from her mouth and it was it was funny because I was talking to somebody about the, the lady was a doctor. She and she runs a human trafficking course at university and things. And she was talking to her and, and she, even she was like, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know that, that you could do that or you could. So it's what you can learn from a 12 year old is way more than what we're going to be able to teach. Wow, Alana Stott, this this is one of my most enjoyable conversations. I, I did know it was going to be big and I knew that there was a lot of different aspects to you and your life and your history. I mean, everyone on the show should, should go, if you're interested in asking for money and you have a problem with that, they should definitely go on and get your book if you want to understand how to overcome big challenges and really deal with adversity and, and make 
a huge impact in your life then she who dares is, is for you but obviously the kids but like people should be jumping on and getting those books but they should also you, you do speaking you do you go out and do speaking or podcasts in this way yeah i do um how to ask for money talks i do mm. human trafficking talks obviously and then the mm. she who dares one so yeah i do i do a few different ones i think there's a lot of the toughness the integrity the fighting for these causes a bit fighting in the way that's actually going to make a difference which is i really like these things make me mad and it's like now you're actually helping me just understand right these are the things you can if you're mad get mad in the right way and this is how we can do it and how can people find out more about you where should they go to um so everywhere is alanastott.com um Alana, Alana Stott, Instagram, Twitter, all the, I've just said all the old ones that I'm on. I'm not on any of the new modern ones, but. <laughs> That's where yeah. they get you. Yeah. Um, if they need a body, bodyguard, I'm, I'm guessing the same thing. They can, they can, they know. <laughs> <laughs> this has been an absolute pleasure and I'm sure it's going to help thousands of people just in every aspect of what we've discussed. And I think this has been eye opening for me. I've in, really enjoyed getting to know you and hopefully Man, we can have you on again at another point in, in history because I, I feel like this is this is also like this journey is just going to keep evolving there's more to come there's more things happening so really uh, thank you so much thank you for having me on and for getting up early for me ah oh, anytime <laughs> this is all part of it 